the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and welcome to the White House, if someone hasn't already said that. I'm delighted that you're here, and I know that you've had briefings on uh, Social Security and uh, energy, transportation, and the budget issues. And uh, I'd like to say just a word or two in a very brief monologue about the economy and, and uh, federalism, which is still very much a priority with us. I know that this last year has been painful, especially at the state and local government level. And your job hasn't been made any easier by the recession and the accompanying unemployment. But here at our end, as you've probably already been told today, we didn't believe that the answer to your problems or our own was going to be another try at a quick fix. And uh, that we've had in the past, and uh, then a couple of years later, things usually turned out to be worse than they were before. In the past 20 years, we've had two periods of sustained economic growth, and in each case, inflation increased. And the result was that both of those periods were followed by a new and an even worse recession. Now, we felt that the only way to not have that same experience repeated was be to have growth but growth that was non-inflationary. And I think we've come a long way in that, and I don't mean to suddenly stick myself way out in front as saying everything is going, going to be rosy day after tomorrow. We know better than that. But last year, inflation from the 12.4 that we knew was down to 3.9 percent for all of 1982. And for the last six months, it has been at an annualized rate of less than 2 percent, as a matter of fact, 1.4 percent for these six months. The economic recovery does seem to be taking shape. The index of the leading indicators went up in January 3.6 percent, and that was the biggest single increase in 33 years. Uh, the construction spending in January was also up at an annualized rate of 8.4 percent, and that was the highest since 1946. Auto production is up 50 percent over a year ago, and uh, we've just learned of the steel industry calling 20,000 of its layoffs back to work. That can't be described as more than a start, but it is a, it is a start. Other indicators of the same kind, including letters that I'm getting from uh, independent businessmen, representative of the small business community. I have just one a man has just written me, and I just answered his letter this morning. He wrote to tell me that uh, they checked their December figures. He's in a building supply company and found they've been in business for 30 years, that the month, last month of December was the highest month they've had in the 30 years. And January was just a little bit below December, but still way above anything that they'd ever known before in their business. And these, these things are coming in increasingly. To keep this going, we know that the answer has to be a continued slowing of federal spending. Now, with regard to federalism, having said that, uh, we've sent our information or our legislation on that up to the Hill. It calls for four mega block grants, as we're referring to them. Uh, it is not a budget balancing measure or intended to aid us in, in that respect. What we have in mind is that what Congress will approve for us in the in 84, in those block grants, we will freeze into the budget for all the way through 88. The we propose to retain revenue sharing, as we think it is one of the most practical things for all of you. 
and we're going to fight hard to continue. As you know, we have made some gains in restoring the distortions that have taken place over recent decades and getting some things back, authority and autonomy at local and state levels of government that has been seized by the federal government. I remember the first vote I cast in 1932 for the New Deal, and I remember that the platform upon which FDR ran that time was a platform that said that the federal government he pledged to restore to local and state governments and to the individuals constitutional authority and autonomy that had been unjustly seized by the federal government. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to make that vote pay off if I can. <laughs> but now, that's enough monologue. You've had enough of that all day long. Uh, maybe there's time for some questions and a little dialogue that we can have here. Yes. President Senator John Stauffer of uh, Pennsylvania, as you know, many of us in the Northeast industrial states have been hit awfully hard in the unemployment situation. And even though we've been trying to wrestle with our unemployment compensation problems, we still have been forced to come to the federal government for some help in the form of loans. The interest on those loans is a real backbreaker for us. Is there any chance that we can get some help as far as the interest is concerned on the repayment? rather than, you know, let us pay the principal. Give us a little help on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what the situation is there. I do know that we have, uh, we have legislation right now that's before the Senate uh, and has passed the House in an entire bill that includes uh, expanded spending on our part for um, uh, unemployment insurance and some measures that you're probably very familiar with or have been briefed on already about trying to um, find a way in which unemployment insurance can be used for, uh, well, as options for employment. Instead of taking the money, take it to an employer, and he gets the option, but the individual gets the job. Uh, job re relocation, training, and other things of that kind. I'll, I must confess, I haven't been in any discussions about the problem that you just named there and what it is, but let me get into some discussions about that. <laughs> All right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, and I'm glad that they, I can remember when they didn't make the questions respectful. <laughs> back, <laughs> back when I was a governor. Um, <laughs> but um, yes, we are. I think there's been a great deal of misinformation. And I have seen news items about students in other parts of the country. And I think they've been misled as to what we have done with regard to college aid. We are providing aid for some five and a half million of the uh, 12 and a half million uh, college students in the, in the country today. What we have done, and I'm sure that there are some individuals discomfited by this, we found that we felt with what we could do that some of that aid was being aimed toward families that should be expected with their incomes to take care of the situation themselves. We've changed that and redirected that aid toward people of lower income. So I think that we're doing as much as has ever been done, but it's been redirected uh, with regard to loans and, uh, and the low interest college loans. That we, we've also done that. We found out that we were providing some of those loans that when the interest rates were so high, that there were families that were getting those low interest rate loans. They didn't need the loan to send their sons and daughters to college, but they were then reinvesting that in government bonds at a higher rate of interest and making a profit on that loan and sending their kids to college at the same time. We tried to correct some things of that kind, but I, we've got to do more to make them understand that, because uh, I think there must be a great deal of fear among many of them that there is still 
just about as much as has ever been done for them, but more of it is redirected, as I say, toward those of low, lower means. And, yeah. Mr. President, uh, John Gaffney, a freeholder from Lane County, New Jersey. We talked before you got here about workfare, so for people, and uh, I just want to give you one example in New Jersey with the Republican administration and your administration here. We thought things were going to take off well with the uh, workfare program. We have an unusual uh, ability in Atlantic County with casinos and getting private sector involvement. I spoke with Rich about this at, at, at our NACO convention, but just so you might know, we have been experiencing some problems getting from uh, the state house in, Tr in Trenton uh, with your people here, conflict and regulations. And uh, we have a, a very good program that's called STEP, which is, is uh, coinciding with your wind program. But I just want you to be aware that even though we have uh, the ability, maybe peculiar in Atlantic County because uh, our economy is going up as other people may not be, we're having a little problem coordinating it. It's getting started. And I didn't get any further with this one, but I just want you to be aware of that. I think sometimes you don't hear these things. Oh. Well, is this work fair in connection with able-bodied uh, welfare recipients? Yes. Uh, well, I wish you well, and I don't know just where your plan is or how far, but we started an experiment of that kind. At that time, the federal government would only allow us to experiment in part of the state in California when I was governor, 35 uh, out of our 58 counties. But the, uh, what we did first was ask local levels of government, school from school districts on up through city and county governments, to send us lists of work that, as we described it, that if they had the money and the manpower, they would be performing. And then we looked at them to make sure that these were legitimate jobs and not uh, dig a hole and fill it up again type of work. And we approved those, those jobs. And then when the day came, we or they were allowed to order that the able-bodied welfare recipients had to report, and they'd picked out the jobs where they were to go and report for, for assignment and work at these jobs. They only had to work uh, a 20 hour week and the rest of the time was supposed to be devoted to looking for a job or taking job training and we assigned some of our people from our labor department as job agents, we called them, to take a cluster of these people as an agent would and they were his clients and to see how quickly they could get them out of that work fair and into a private enterprise job. The first plus in the program were the thousands who never reported and we just stopped giving them their checks and never heard a single complaint because I'm convinced that we only know how many checks we're writing, we don't know how many people are actually getting welfare. And these had to be what I call paper people, that they knew if they reported for that job, uh, it would be learned that uh, they, they weren't real welfare recipients. This was during the 1974 recession. And through that job program, we funneled 76,000 welfare recipients into private enterprise jobs in the middle of a recession. My, my use of that, I'm only giving that experience. I don't know what your situation is, but I'm a great believer in this. I think that, because those that did report, I think that the bulk of welfare recipients want nothing more than to be out there independent making their own way free of the caseworker. And it turned out that way. I agree. Yeah. Just, just keep pushing from your end. Okay? Some, sometimes, what? They, sometimes they don't hear you. Right? I mean, <laughs> well, all right. I guess, yes, ma'am. I'm, then I got to come over this way. Uh, I'm Elaine Zedek from Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Chairman of the County Commissioners. A bit of trivia. I served, uh, I, I also shared your birthday with Mr. Gaffney. Uh, I wanted to congratulate him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the same year now. <laughs> I was going to say that. <laughs> I want to congratulate you upon your last two choices for uh, captain. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Believe me, the, the cabinet meetings are much more attractive. Yeah, but uh, both of those people that I know are going to do a tremendous job. And uh, 
One, of course, has been in the Congress. The other one has been here in our administration, Elizabeth Dole, and uh, has been doing a tremendous job. And that's why she was moved to where she is. All right. Yes. Well, I appreciate that. I am a great believer in private initiative in the private sector, and I, I think that's great. And I'll, I'll really be watching to, uh, to see what the result is on that. Yes? I, I have to tell you, I, I, if Jack Block were here, I'd let him answer that question for you. I, I don't believe that I can, I can give an answer here as to, uh, as to what it is you're comparing and what the, the problem is. I know we've been trying to solve the dairy products problem, which I know you're talking about, uh, trying to resolve that and find an answer to it for quite some time. But um, I don't know the details. Uh, This is, I, I got that it's Congressman Jeffords and, and a bill that he's, I will look into that and find out what that legislation is, and uh, I shall also talk to Jack Block about it. And, Well, we don't think that there's any comparison between what it is we're proposing and the, the, the old CETA program. Uh, for one thing, in the CETA job training programs, only 18% of the money was actually going to training. In our job training, 70% will be going to actual training. But also, the jobs themselves, what we've done is not create some program of jobs as some of those other programs did. We looked ahead and saw that our own agencies and departments had all kinds of work from construction, maintenance, repair, and so forth built into budgets in the out, on the outgoing years and beginning in 18, or 1984. And what we've just conceived of is the idea, which isn't new money at all, but simply say, wait a minute, the time is now where we need jobs and to accelerate and move up and start doing those already approved jobs now instead of in waiting for uh, 84 and the years beyond to do them and that's a part of the package that is up there before the senate now that we'll accelerate that work to create some employment you there no i don't excuse me uh, not in the uh, emergency jobs bill that's now being tied up by that withholding provision. There's not, the, uh, there's not any uh, public service jobs similar to CETA. It is true the President's proposed last Friday a structural jobs bill, which is much more far-reaching, and there is uh, reports that some in Congress will attempt to tack that on, but that's not part of the President's package. No.
All right, you bet. and the prices have been going up, not consistently. In one place there will still be, due to the, the mixed up nature of that bill, someone that, some community that's doing just fine, but in other areas, well, the most recent price increase in much of the country was 20 percent, and this was under decontrol. And we looked at what we did with the decontrol of oil, and everyone said that we were going to have two dollar a gallon gasoline. Well, we decontrolled oil, <laughs> and we have gasoline at less than a dollar in most of the country today. We think that uh, putting in a, a protection clause to make sure that someone can't run wild, we believe that what we're doing is going to bring the price of natural gas down. There's an awful lot of natural gas in this country that is capped right now because it's uneconomic for them under the control laws uh, to bring it out and, and uh, make use of it. So uh, we are going to protect against that. There was this lady right back there, and uh, after her, one more question. Well, now, thank you very much. I, I have to tell you, the gender gap, yes, I take it seriously. I'm very disturbed by it. Uh, some of my best friends are women. <laughs> uh, no, but the, I, I, I feel there's a little injustice done here because I think uh, we've done better than most administrations have uh, in that regard. And um, we... <laughs> I want to, want to continue that. Uh, what I need from all of you is how did we get the word around <laughs> that we're doing this? I'm, I'm going to go back to the back row there. Because they tell me I'm all, I've used up my time. Well, we had passed that as a part of the tax package, and our reason for passing the, the withholding of, of interest was the fact that we have found that one of the big loopholes, well, I shouldn't call it a loophole, that gives a wrong connotation, one of the big places where people who avoid paying the tax they owe is in the area of interest and dividends, and the Treasury Department there's just no way to have the manpower that would be required to try and plug that and track down these individuals. We estimated at around five billion dollars a year of taxes owed, legitimately owed, that are not being paid. And in this time of deficits when we're trying to get before the decade's over down to a balanced budget, it seemed to me that we were entitled uh, to go after this money. Now. I think there's been a great distortion here also on who we're uh, asking to do this. People at, whose receipts are lower, the lower income and who uh, interest that they may have in a savings account is lower, they don't have, they're exempt. Almost everyone over age 65 is exempt. And so there's really only a small percentage of people that are going to be affected by this, but it's also going to include that percentage of people who are not paying the tax they owe. And so we feel that this should be given a, it was passed to now before it even goes into effect, 
uh, we delayed it uh, in the interest of the banks and the savings and loans companies from going into effect in January and delayed it six months to July uh, to give them more of a chance to gear for this. And actually, this whole idea that this is penalizing somehow the saver, we find that the, uh, the withholding, the increase in taking, say, some of that money away, that interest money, uh, before it might compound more, is something like, and Rich, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the figure is something like about, it costs about 50 cents out of every $150, something of that kind, which we don't think is, is really a hardship on anyone. Now, your senator uh, is tagging this on to a bill that he feels I would not want to veto, and you know what that brings me to? All of you who are out there at the other levels of government, weren't. if you join me in a drive to give a president of the United States for the first time the right to line item veto, we wouldn't have these problems. Uh, as governor, they, they tell me that I've used up my time. I'm, Oh, I shouldn't have looked that way. There's a lady there. I can't say no to her. But let me just, before you ask the question, let me, let me just say that as governor, I line item vetoed over $16 billion, 943 vetoes in eight years without ever having one of them overridden. And that's why, you know what that is. That's a bill. They hang something on a bill that they know you've just almost have to sign and know that if it had to stand on its own, that amendment would never get by. And uh, the president doesn't have that. And I'll just, I'm gonna take one second and then I'll get your question. One second uh, to tell a little experience. A previous president, Jerry Ford and Betty, uh, while I was still governor, had Nancy and me come down to Palm Springs to, uh, to dinner uh, when they were out there. And the four of us were just sitting there having dinner and Jerry was telling me some of the problems from up here and uh, then I gave an answer on something, and he said, well, yes, but you've got line item veto. And I said, yes, I have. Well, he said, oh, boy, if I only had that. And a quiet voice from across the table, Betty's, <laughs> said, for 25 years, you didn't feel that way. <laughs> and I must say, he admitted it and said, yes, but I see things differently now. Well, please, and, and then I will. I'll quit. This has to be the last question. Mr. President, I'm Donna Simon from New Hampshire House, and I'm also the Republican Party Chairman in New Hampshire. Uh, you may have heard that there have been Democrat contenders for your job. Uh, Mr. Ford, 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 Mr. Ford,
toilet from April 1 until it goes online. What we're trying to do is, of course, we're not, we're, we're, we're stopping checks. Right. If they don't, they're able-bodied. We have to 